We lie. Okay, we lie. All right, first and foremost, I want to give all praises, all the glory unto the most high God, your hallow. We do so in the name of the only we got the Son of the world calls Christ, your hour shy. All right. Um we are observing the feast of first fruits tonight through the spirit of God the most high. Um it's our first. It's our first I home here in Dallas, so all praise the most high for that. And uh I hope the audio is sounding good to the audience. Show me a little spot we in, so we just get the whole stuff. But um honor of the feast, of course, we're gonna go into the law. We're gonna read about all the laws that was commanded to Moses and he gave unto the children of Israel about the feast and how we are to observe it, etc. Right? So go ahead, uh, This is a book of uh, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10. Uh-huh. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them. When ye be come into the lands which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priests. Uh -huh. He shall we he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. You go. Mm -hmm. Kind of verse twelve. And ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the hour. Uh -huh. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto Yahweh for a sweet savor. Mm -hmm. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of a hen. Mm -hmm. Ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the self same day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. All right, so that that was the the. Ordinance that the Most High made for this feast, but keep going. It's going to tell us how we know what day to keep the feast on. Read on. Verse 15. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths. Seven Sabbaths. Read. Shall be complete. Uh, slot. Verse 16. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. Wait, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. Read on. Shall you number 50 days? You see that? So we have seven Sabbaths and then 50 days. Uh, a lot of brothers think that we literally are only supposed to number 50 days, right? But it says after seven Sabbaths, then you number 50 days. That's very important to understand. So usually it's about 100 days in total that's being numbered. A lot of people read right over there. Read that part again. Because I remember I had an argument with a brother about this. And literally he's just ignoring it. It says after this. Then number 50 days, right? So go ahead. Okay. Verse 16. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. After you number seven Sabbaths, read on. Shall he number 50 days? Then you add 50 days. Because seven Sabbaths is not a set amount of time. What do I mean by that? Like, uh, if you are keeping, or if you think that seven Sabbaths is going to be exactly 49 days, it would have told you that. It's not necessarily going to be exactly 49 days. You have to factor in your moon. So you may add a day, you may, you know what I'm saying? So it might be 50 days, 51 days. Then you add 50 days. That's a set amount of days there. You see what I'm saying? 50 days. So it's about 100 days. It could be 100, 100, 2. You see what I'm saying? But it always is going to land right back on the Sabbath, pursuant to the new moon. Go ahead. God. It says, even unto, the, <clears throat> even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath uh -huh. shall you number 50 days. That's plain and simple. Even after, then you number 50 days. Plain and simple. Go ahead. God. And you shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahweh. Mm -hmm. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baking with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Exactly. So what we're doing now is just rehearsing it and things of that nature. Because we're not in our land. We don't have, number one, we don't even have none of this stuff to bring. In ancient Israel you had land, you had animals on your land, you had produce and all that. We don't even have it. Stay in the damn apartment. What's the produce in the apartment? It's none. But we're rehearsing it and we observing these things to show the most high that we want to go back to Zion. Judges 5 and 11. Because some people uh, some people will ridicule brothers and sisters who want to follow after the uh, the high holy days. And we can't do it. We're not in the land. But we have to be rehearsing it to show the most high that we want to go back to doing these things. Right? Go ahead. Come on, let's look at Judges chapter 5, verse 11. Mm -hmm. They that are delivered from the noise of archers in the place of drawing water. Mm -hmm. There shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord. We're trying to get delivered from the archers in the place of drawn waters, meaning in the place of our slavery. So here we rehearse the righteous acts of the Most High. Right? Read on. 
even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages. Toward the inhabitants of his villages. So we're rehearsing it like we were doing it back when we were in the land, right? Read. Uh, toward the inhabitant of the of his villages in Israel, then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. You see that? So now let's get first Corinthians uh, 16 and 15. Read uh, 15, 15 and 16. So 16, 15. 16 and 15, but I need the 15 and 16 for the right here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to pull it up too. Uh, probably in the NLT. Well, go ahead. God, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15. Uh -huh. It says, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanas, that is the first fruits of Achaia. That is what? The first fruits of Achaia. Right on. And that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. So as we see, it says the first fruits of a particular individual. Because what he's talking about is the brothers who are in this particular city who was doing the work. Read it again from the top. God, this is 1 Corinthians 16 and 15. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia. Meaning when they went to preach the ministry in Achaia, the first people to wake up to it and, and uh, make themselves a part of it were this particular house, the house of Stephanus. Right, read on. God, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. So like it. They have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They have addicted themselves to the ministry. So that's what the first fruits of the Most High should be doing. Addicted themselves. Because we're dealing with a spiritual first fruits. Since we don't have our literal physical first fruits, a spiritual first fruits. So what should the spiritual first fruits be doing? Read it again. Uh, addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. You should be addicted to the ministry. That's what it's about. That's how we become the spiritual first fruits of the Most High and become the elect of the Most High and things of that nature. Through addicting yourself to the ministry, right? That's our job and position. Everything else is secondary. You know, you go work your job or, you know, do whatever you do. Yeah, of course, we have to do that because we're in a place of our servitude. But our number one thing is the ministry. That's what our primary focus should always be, the ministry. Read on. Uh, verse 16, that ye submit yourselves unto such. That you what? Submit yourselves unto such. See, what he's telling them is this, because the Corinthians... When you deal with, you read first and second Corinthians, right? You'll notice they're a lot longer than all the other letters that Paul wrote. And it's two of them, right? And they both deep. What, what, how many chapters second Corinthians got? 15, two? Some deep, right? Much deeper than Ephesians, Galatians, Romans, Philippians. You said 13? You see what I'm saying? So these are all the series of letters that Paul was writing to the Corinthians because the Corinthians was known as a problem church. If you read about all the different instances and in, in, um, uh, events that are recurring in Corinth, they're always messing up in Corinth. So Paul was trying to tell them something. So he was sending Stephanus from Achaia, right, to come and basically oversee the church at Corinth. And he said these men have addicted themselves to the ministry, so you should submit yourself to them. Right? Read that again. Okay. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse uh, 16. Uh -huh. That ye submit yourselves unto such into everyone that helpeth with us and labor. You see that? So these are the men that have addicted themselves to the ministry. They labor, they put their work in. So when these guys get to your church, you got to submit yourself to these brothers. Because these brothers are going to get you out right, because somebody got to do it. And you know, Paul was always moving around. So when Paul always moving around, he couldn't just be at every church overseeing. He was setting up all kind of camps, which when we see churches, it's just setting up camps. Setting up all kind of camps all over Asia Minor. He said, listen, I'm I'm sending these dudes from Achaia to come get y'all in line. They was, matter of fact, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, they was doing madness in Corinth, right? Where you at 5? Let me see. No, no, no. Is it 6? So go to 1st. You know what I'm talking about? That much I have his father's wife? Oh. I'm That's 1st. That might be 1st Corinthians. Yeah. Man was doing a lot of madness in corn. That's it? Uh, first grade? I'm still trying to find it. It's, it's, it's five or six, first or second grade. I don't know that for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, I got it. Go ahead. This is First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And so he's saying, listen, I'm getting reports commonly, meaning everybody knows it. That's how much problems was in Corinth. It wasn't a secret. It wasn't like it was just concealed to that, that particular camp. Everybody knew 
the madness that was going on in that camp. He said, I've heard it reported commonly that there be fornication among you. Right, Read. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles. He said that the fornication that the church of Corinth was partaking in was worse than the heathen. Stuff, stuff that the heathens do, right? Read. That one should have his father's wife. That what? One should have his father's wife. That's madness. Who, what, what culture of people is that common with? That people are having sex with their daddy girl? That's crazy. But that's the type of stuff they were doing in Corinth. Right? Where is Corinth at? What country? Corinth. City of Corinth is where? Greece. See, Greece. Greece, was, they was doing all kind of debauchery in Greece. They was, I'm talking all kind of temple orgies. There's a show called um, Spartacus, right? Right, so you see Spartacus. You watch Spartacus, you'll see the type of debauchery that they was doing in ancient Greece. I'm talking about absolute madness. All kind of, and that's what a lot of that, that type of culture was introduced to our people. Homosexuality, orgies, just all kind of madness like that comes from them. So you have a situation where brothers is getting raised up out of a, a particular municipality in Greece. And these brothers, of course, are being influenced by what? By the ways of the Greek still. Just like us, we all waking up and we compromised by the ways of America. The ways of America have influenced us, they've gotten to our mind, and sometimes they fight against the Holy Spirit. You see what I'm saying? With it, right? You got a precept? Yeah, I have a point. Because uh, that goes back to remember that debate. That guy said you can have sex with your mom. Man. Oh, yeah, the dude just said it. Which, right? which, is, your which is your father's wife. Yeah. And really, where that comes from, because uh, a lot of Greeks, they got their stuff from Egypt. From Asia, that's right? right. So this is Leviticus 18 and 3. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. You see that? That's what. When the northern kingdom wanted to leave Assyria, what did the northern kingdom say? We all go away from the heathen, right? That was the whole goal. We got to get the hell away from the heathen because the heathen have constantly influenced us to do the wrong thing, right? So the first thing Moses is telling us when we come out of Egypt is do not be like the Egyptians. You just spent centuries in Egypt watching these people, they debaucherous ways. Don't be like them. But then also, y'all coming into Canaan. These Canaanites, they similar to the Egyptians. They kill babies, they have all kind of orgies, do madness too. Don't be like them, right? But constantly, we have allowed the heathen to influence us, right? Which is why it's so important that we fight it now. And, and even more so, the way that the white man influences us, I think, I think um, it pales, the Egyptians and Canaanites pale in comparison to the way that the white man influences us in this time. People want to be the white man so damn bad. Give me hold that. Give me um uh first Maccabees. Let me got right here. First Maccabees four. Slot the second Maccabees four and fifteen to seventeen because that's that's I'm talking about. Our people love following after the ways of the white man the same way we follow after the ways of the Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Greek, and the Canaanite and every other heathen people that have ever came and oppressed us. And that's why the Most High allows them to come and oppress us. Though. That's what we have to understand. The more we want to be like somebody that's not an Israelite, the more the Most High God is going to make them people come and oppress us and kill us, etc. Right? Read that. God, this is Second Maccabees chapter four, verse fifteen. Uh huh. The seventeen. God says, "Not setting by the honors of their fathers." First problem: not setting by the honors of our fathers. We have to follow the customs that have been given to us by our forefathers. That's what we have to set by. Read. But liking the glory of the Grecians, best of all. Liking what? The glory of the Grecians, best of all. Oh, that uh, 1 Corinthians, what is that, 6? You know what I want? The glory of a man. Um, liking the glory of the Grecians, best of all. That's key because that there's different layers to that, right? Basically holding yourself to the standard of the Greek or the so-called white man. But there's a, a key point I like to really hone in on. On this topic, you know what I'm talking about? There we go. Yeah, eleven and seven. That's it. So like, now, this is First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse seven. Uh -huh. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Read. For as much as he is the image and glory of God, read. But the woman is the glory of the man. What is? The woman is the glory of the man. The woman is the glory of the man. I read that in Maccabees. Uh, this is 2 Maccabees chapter 4, verse 15. 
not sitting by the honor of their fathers, but liking the glory of the Grecians best of all. So if the glory of man is a woman, what is part of the glory of the Grecians? They're a woman. So when Negroes out here seeking after the white woman, and that's the and like she's the number one woman on the planet, she's they're liking the glory of the Grecians best of all. Basically, when a Negro, a lot of times I tell when a Negro gets with a white woman, it's because he's trying to have a white life. You understand what I'm saying? You look at okay, what does a white man do? He gets his white wife, he gets a white picket fence house, he does all these various things, right? So that's what they're seeking for, right? We don't uh, by reason where a sore calamity came upon them. What happened? Sore calamity came upon them. They like the glory of the Grecians, and sore calamity comes upon them. Right? So the Most High judges us when we start to seek after the glory of the other nations. Part of that includes what? His woman. Right? Go ahead. For they had them to be their enemies and avengers whose custom they follow so earnestly. You follow their custom, you learn their ways, you're trying to be just like them. And the Most High sends them to start to kill, to start to enslave, to start to oppress you. Right? Read. Uh, and unto whom they desire to be like in all things. What? Read that again. And unto whom they desire to be like in all things. That's the problem. Niggas want to be just like the white man in all things. The same way in previous captivity, we want to be like the Egyptian. We want to be like the Babylonian. We want to be like the Canaanite. Our people have a serial issue with trying to be like somebody else in all their ways. Not just in one thing. You don't just want to eat his food. Right? His food just ain't good. You want to be him exactly. Right, and that is the problem with a lot of our people. That's something that we got to fight every day. Right, go ahead. Verse 17, for it is not a light thing. It's not a small thing. People act like it's a small thing to assimilate into, into this heathen culture. But it's not a light thing, read, to do wickedly against the laws of God. It's not a light thing to do wickedly against the laws of God. So following the Grecians, go back to that in the, uh, uh, Corinthians, following the Grecians led certain members of the church of Corinth for the camp at Corinth. To do what? To uh, um, follow Salakia. To want to be like these people in all things. So they fornicated. They broke the laws of God. And that's not a light thing. Keep going in that. You want that other glory? No, no, no. I want uh, back in um, verse chapter 5 of that. Okay, yeah. No. Salakia. I want to continue in that. But this is the type of stuff that was going on in Corinth. So that's why he had to send the first fruits of the chaos over the corn to oversee it. You see what I'm saying? But who were the first fruits? Those who addicted themselves to the ministry. Right, Read. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Uh -huh. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, uh -huh. that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned. You see that? And not rather mourned. So the individuals who were guilty of this, he said they were puffed up and not Rather more, meaning they did it and they weren't remorseful about it. He didn't care that he had sex with his father's wife. That wasn't a big deal to him. It was cool. Why? Because he came from a culture where it was cool. Read. Come. That he so like, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Mm -hmm. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. Yeah, keep going. In the name of our Lord Yahweh, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Yahweh Hamashiach, to deliver such an one unto Satan. Deliver him to Satan. Get rid of that dude. Bye. You gotta go. You do something evil like have sex with your father's woman, you gotta go. That's ridiculous, right? Read. God, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. For the destruction of the flesh. Meaning that man gotta die. Right. Right? He has to die. Read. That the spirit may be saved. That his spirit may be saved. That way his spirit could be separated from his sinful flesh. Right. Because that's something that he could uh, tran uh, transcend. Question or, or point? Exactly. Yeah, by, by, the, by his flesh. So I thought when you do evil with your flesh, you got to go to hell. Right? He ain't going to hell. We try to save his spirit. Right, period. Right. Matter of fact, um, hold that Romans seven. Romans seven, because this is what Paul is talking about in Romans seven, dealing with the constant war that's taking place between your flesh and your spirit. And that dude lost the war. So because he lost the war, he needed to be separated from his flesh. Period. Right. Uh, uh, no, 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 not that far. You might probably want to start early because this whole whole chapter is really about it. Uh, so like, oh, yeah, seven. Oh, oh. 
You said 15? About 15? There you go. You're right. Come on. For the, come on. This is Romans 7 and 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But which I, but that would I hate, that do I. That do I. I mean, I do things I hate. I do wicked things. I do fleshly things. My flesh is, is making me break the laws of God. Read. Come on. So like it started 14, actually. Uh, verse 14, Romans 7 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. The law is what? Spiritual. It's a spiritual law. The law is spiritual. The law is spiritual. People act like it's a spiritual law. It's a new thing. No, the law is spiritual. It's what it is. Read. Uh, but I am carnal. But I am carnal. Wait, I thought the laws were written on his heart. I thought he was in a new covenant. What, what is he? Uh, I am carnal. He's carnal. Read. Sold under sin. And he's sold to sin. I Meaning his flesh wants to sin. You see that? Sometimes you just got to read things because some things are just such cuts to certain ideology you won't even think of. It ain't nothing about a new covenant here, but you know he ain't under the new covenant if he's sold to sin. Don't make a, that mean the law ain't on his heart, right? Read. Come For that which I do, I allow not. Uh -huh. For what I would, that do I not. Uh -huh. But what I, what I want to do is be righteous, not break the laws of God, but I, I don't do it. Read. But what I hate, that do I. That's what I'm doing, what I hate. That's the war that's going on. You have precepts? Yeah. This is, uh, this is Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. Your spirit is willing. You heard the truth. Your spirit's like, man, I want to be a perfect law keeper. I want to keep every single law. The spirit is willing to read. But the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. This goes back to our lesson. Spirits don't sin. Right? That's how you know it ain't no fallen angel, that whole fallen angel, man. It's impossible because they spirits. Spirits don't sin. When Satan wanted to go tell Job, what did he do? He asked, let me see about Job. Didn't make a move until he got permission to go see about Job, period. So there's no other way around it. Your spirit is not going to sin. It's your flesh that's going to sin. Go ahead. John, verse 16. It says, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. As the law is good, right? The, now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Sin that's dwelling in me. Where does sin dwell? In your flesh. Hold that. Go to um, Jude. What's that? About the sixth verse? Uh, sixth. The um, everlasting chain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. John, this is Jude chapter 1, verse 6. It says, And the angels which kept not their first estate. This is a fallen angel doctrine. The angels that kept not their first estate. We're the angels that kept not our first estate. How not? Adam. Right? Adam sinned. We're no longer in our first estate. Read. But left their own habitation. Adam left his own habitation. Read. He hath reserved in everlasting chains. Reserved in what? Everlasting chains. These bodies are everlasting chains. That's what sin is. It's in these bodies, in this flesh. That's what the everlasting chain is. This is like a prison. You see, what I'm we're in a prison right now, right? Of our own flesh. And our own flesh has a desire to serially sin and break the laws of the Most High. Meanwhile, our spirit is trying to just be righteous, trying to please the Most High in all things. But our flesh is fighting against it. That's the everlasting chain. Read. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Until the judgment. After judgment day, we're no longer going to be in chains. Why? Get, matter of fact, go to 1 Corinthians, was that uh, uh, 15? 1 Corinthians 15, and like at the very end, twinkle in our eye. Show the body to change. Yeah. There you go. This is, uh, no, it's not 4. It's towards the end. It might be, you said what? Verse 40. Is it 45? Um, no. I'm sorry. Uh, There's a description for the uh, 52. Oh, this, first, first, all right, go ahead. this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the, at the last trump. That's the day. That's the great day it's talking about in Jude. Read. For the trumpet shall sound, uh -huh. and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Ooh. And we shall be changed. We shall be what? We shall be changed. No longer. In that bondage in those everlasting chains. You see that? We're gonna be changed. That's when the new covenant comes, right? No other time is the new covenant. We're not in the new covenant now. Had a Uncle Tomahawk come up to camp talking about we in the new covenant right. with a ball at his head. We in the new covenant. You got a damn Jordan ball head. Right. Talking about we in the new covenant. You out of your damn mind. That's out, right? Listen on that. 
No, there's some more. More, go ahead. It says, verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. That's what, we're corruptible. Why? Because we have everlasting change. It's flesh, so we must put on incorruption. That ain't going to happen until we get saved. Go ahead. And this mortal must put on immortality. You see that? We, we can't do it now because we're mortal. So we come shoot you in the head, you're dead. You're mortal. Go ahead. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. You see that? That's talking about when the salvation comes. Not a moment before that, right? Not a moment sooner. Get on. Where was we at? I know I had, I had you hold. We were in Corinthians still. Yeah. We can drop that at Corinthians because that was the point. Um, we, we we went to Romans, so hold Romans seven. But let's go to Jeremiah thirty one, and then we go bounce to Ezekiel twenty, right? Because I got a scripture on Ezekiel twenty. Uh, give me the new covenant. This is the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, uh -huh. which my covenant they break. He broke that last covenant, right, Read. Really? Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Mm -hmm. And that just cuts that whole notion that when Christ said it is, it is finished, that that's when the new covenant began. Because if that's the case, then why did Paul, you know what I'm saying? Why was Paul saying he's carnal? Verse 34, and they shall teach no more every man's neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. All right, go ahead. That's on the new covenant. Okay, go to Ezekiel 20. So that's what the new covenant is. We understand the law being written in our hearts and our minds, meaning it's going to be set to nature for us to keep them and to do them, right? But, uh, let's go here. Go ahead. This is the book of Ezekiel, chapter 20, verse 35. Okay. Get uh, Jeremiah 31 and holy, holy. We're going to bounce to it. So like it. I'll right back to it. Amen. All right, go back to Ezekiel 23. This is book of Ezekiel chapter 20. I'm going to start at verse, uh, I'll get to the point, verse 35. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. Uh -huh. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. Uh -huh. And I will cause you to pass under the rod. I will cause you to what? To pass under the rod. Pass under the rod. Remember that. Read. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And bring you into the bond of the covenant. Hold that. Go back to 31. See what it says. I shall be their God. Come on. It says, uh, it says, this is Jeremiah 31 and 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God. And will be what? Their God. Be their God. Right? So when it say pass under the rod, it's the same thing as him saying. He will be their God. But through that, let's go to uh, Leviticus 27 to 32 real quick. Because that's what it means to be passed under the rock. It's the book of Leviticus chapter 27, verse 32. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod. What so what? Passeth under the rod. Right, so you have to tithe of your herd and your flock. What passeth under your rod. Meaning you're the shepherd. Of these particular animals, and they pass under your rod, meaning you're the one that leads them. So when it says he's gonna cause us to pass under the rod, it means he's gonna be our God again. We're gonna be under his guidance and leadership and follow his instructions again. Which us as a nation, even though there's a remnant of us that are trying to do it, us as a nation is not doing it right now. So when is he gonna cause Israel to pass under the rod when he brings in a new covenant again? So this is another thing that we clearly can see how the new covenant is something that's not in play yet. Contrary to the doctrine of the Christian church. Go ahead, finish that. Con. Whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tent shall be holy unto your house. Yes, whatever passeth under your rod, meaning you're leading this flock. 10% of the flock that you led would be given to the Most High God. That's in an ancient time, right? So why? Because that's who you were in control of. So in the same way that we will pass under the rod, meaning we're going to be, the Most High is going to be our shepherd again. Like it says, sorry, everybody know the prayer. 
Lord is my shepherd, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? That ain't happening right now as a whole to Israel because Israel is not following the shepherd of the Most High, right? Average Israelite walking down the street is eating pork, doing all kind of madness, right? Just that, that's just on a small level, pork, let alone idolatry and fornication and sorcery that all of our people are partaking. So clearly they haven't passed under the rod of the Most High, but Israel's going to pass under that rod in the wilderness. That's when the new covenant will come in. So finish that out, Ezekiel. Now, this book of Ezekiel, chapter 20, verse 38. And I will purge out from among you the rebels, and them that transgress against me. I will bring them. The, there's rebels and them that transgress against the Most High. Those are people who have not passed under the rod of the Most High, right? So they'll be purged, then Israel will be brought under that rod. Ain't going to be no rebels left. Go ahead. <clears throat> and I'll purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the hour. There you go, right? So listen on that. Okay. Let's go back to Romans 7. Read a little bit more on that. Uh, what we leave off at? We left off at 19. Go ahead. I'm sorry, verse 18. This is uh, Romans 7 and 17. Where we left off. It says, Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I, like, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Uh, verse twenty-one. Mm -hmm. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. He finds a law that when he would do good, evil is present with him. See, a Christian will go here and say, "See, the law is evil." No, he's saying there's a different law in his members than the one that's in his spirit. The law in his spirit is the laws of the Most High. The law in his members is a law of sin, a law of, like, like what did the brother said when he came up, I made my own religion. I follow my own religion. Right, right, right. That's the law that's in your flesh, right? Read. Uh, it says, verse 21, verse 22, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. My inward man, my spirit delight after the law of God. They don't read that part. Right. Read. But I see another law in my members. Uh, there's another law. So the one he's getting ready to talk negatively about is the one in his members. But the Christian church will isogene, as they say, yeah. right? The ones that talk about the law of his members and act like he's talking about the laws of God. Matters, read. Which is cold because they'll always go to Romans 8 and 2 when it says, for law is spirit of life in Christ, that may be free from the law of sin and death. And they'll try to use that to say you don't have to keep the law. But if you really read it in context, it's talking about the law of his members. Yeah, because you have to remember that when Paul was writing these letters, he didn't have chapter seven, yeah. chapter eight. That wasn't there. This is a continuous letter. So when it's translated and it's edited and things of that nature, they put it in the chapters and verses so we can locate each thing easy. But it wasn't there when he wrote it. So he's continuing on to say, talk about the law right. of sin and death. He talked about the one that's in his members. Sometimes you gotta even go back into the previous chapter to fully understand context, right? Go ahead. Yeah, that's why when you read at verse one, it says, there's therefore, Right, but when you see the word therefore, it's because he's, he's uh, continuing on what he just said. That's right, right? Um, but this is Romans 7 and 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. Matter of fact, hold that. Let me see. Because it does it right here, too. If you go to 16. Oh, it might be the yeah, second, the second. No, it's like it. It's currently, it's not wrong with the wives. If you go to first Corinthians six, so I know trick wrong this first. First Corinthians six. Watch. Okay, watch. So I can say it's the one to say um uh 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 it's about the promises. No, it's right here. Touch not the unclean thing. Oh, yeah. Right. So, yeah, yeah watch. Six and seven, watch. Seven. You're going to start at uh, 
16, and we're going to read, though, into chapter 7. Into 7 is where it's going to make the point. You got the precept right there. So read into 7. Go ahead. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. It says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. See, this is a cut to the Christian doctrine as well. But they also always like to isolate it because he said, as it is written. Well, where was that written at? And who was it talking about? It was written in what they call the Old Testament. It was talking about the Israelites. So that proves that the Corinthians had to be Israelites because it ain't written that nobody else in the most high was going to dwell in and walk with. That's never been written about any other nation but Israel. Right? Read. That's fact. Verse 17, wherefore come out from among them. Come out from among who? These other people who God will not dwell with. Right. Read. And be ye separate. Separate yourself from these nations. Read. Said the Lord. Uh -huh. And touch not the unclean thing. He's telling them to stop having sex with your father's wife. Right. Same church he's getting on. Right. Go ahead. And I will receive you and will be a father unto you. Uh -huh. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. All promises that he made to Israel. So where are they getting that these are not Israelites? These are, these are all exclusive promises to the nation. Right? Right. Having therefore these promises. Having these promises. So he's listening to these things and he's telling you these are promises. Having these promises. Read. Now this is into the next chapter now. That's why you got to keep reading. It's chapter 7, verse 1. We read from chapter 6, verse 16. Read. It says, Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. Uh -huh. and How do we know what's filthiness of the flesh? The law tells us. Not, there's nothing else to tell you your flesh is filthy, but the law tells you what's clean and unclean, right? Read. And spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You see that? But they never want to read all of it in context and go into the next chapter because it starts to make their doctrine inconsistent now because all of this is only dealing with Israel. He never made these promises with nobody else, right? Read Oh, you got to do around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is look at Deuteronomy chapter six, verse two. It says that thou mightest fear Yahweh thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I commanded thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days might be prolonged. And, and hold on, but no, because it's saying that when you that last verse, it said that you may fear the Lord. So it's the same. He's reinstituting the same commandment to thou thy son and thy son's son, not. Thou thy son, the Philistine, the Hittite, the Edomite, the Moabite. Notice that. Thou thy son and thy son's son, right? That's it on that? Okay, let's go back to Romans 7. Let me see where we at there. Ain't much more. And then I want you to hit that Corinthians and Indo team. We can flow on that. Come on, all right, let's go hit that in the Indo team. First Corinthians, the one we started with, First Corinthians 16, 15 to 16. In the NLT, yes, sir. Sixteen, right? Come. This is First Corinthians sixteen to sixteen. In that, so like the fifteen, fifteen to sixteen. Oh, 15, fifteen to sixteen. First Corinthians sixteen, fifteen. Yes, sir. So like uh, it says. Uh, you know that Stephanus and his household were the first of the harvest of believers in Greece. You see it, so it's telling you what the first was the first of the harvest of the believers, right? Read. And they are spending their lives. They spend their lives doing what? In service to God's people. Oh, we. That's what they spend their lives doing. That's what the first groups are going to be doing. Spending their lives in service to God's people. That's frustrating, isn't it? It's not frustrating it is to spend your life in service to God's people. Just what I know. Brother, call and ask simple questions. Sister mad at her husband. Just he's talking to his own sister. I don't really, you know, I mean, I know polygamy's all right, but you know, I don't really like her. We, I don't think she's gonna be a good fit for this family. If you don't get off my damn phone, you see what I'm saying? But it's it's what we have to do. We spend our life with this, right? John, it says uh, they are spending their lives in the service to God's people. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to submit to them and others like them. Who serve with such devotion. Exactly. Brothers who serve with such devotion are who, you know, the most highest count as his first fruits and the leadership of the nation at this time, right? But with that, we're going to close. So, uh, I'm, oh, you got a precept? All right, go ahead. Just, just to prove uh, the, who the first fruits are, right? This is Revelation 14, verse 3. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, 
and no man can learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Right. So who is the elect? Going to be going back to the other precept. Those who addicted themselves, that they spent their life uh, devoted to the service of the Most High. So with that, we're going to give again all praises to Yahweh, Shem Yahweh, and close on that.